Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical-ish. This is Ancient Mysteries, Volume 2, Episode 2, second half of the first tier. Let's get into it. Number 11, The Mystery of Yamatai Koku. The mystery of Yamatai Koku revolves around the location and historical existence of an ancient kingdom in Japan known as Yamatai Koku, or just Yamatai for short. Yamatai was a powerful nation that existed during the Yayoi period around 300 BC to 300 AD, ruled by the queen Himiko. The history and location of this kingdom is essentially the core of this mystery due to the lack of concrete evidence and various interpretations of ancient texts. Since there are essentially no ancient Japanese sources of information about Yamatai Koku, the main sources of information are the Chinese historical text the Record of the Three Kingdoms, which was written in the 3rd century AD, and the Book of the Later Han, completed in the 5th century AD. Both of these texts provide accounts of Queen Himiko and her kingdom, but neither offers a definitive location for Yamatai Koku. These texts were also written by Chinese scholars with limited knowledge of the Japanese archipelago, which does make it difficult to accurately identify the exact location of the kingdom. So there are essentially two main theories about the location of Yamatai Koku. One is the Kyushu theory, which states that Yamatai is located in the northern part of Kyushu, which is just one of Japan's main islands. Proponents of this theory argue that the descriptions found in the Chinese historical texts align with the geography and distances within Kyushu. Additionally, some archaeological evidence such as the discovery of ancient burial mounds, pottery, and other artifacts supports the idea that a powerful and developed civilization existed in the region during the Yayoi period. There's also the Kinki theory, which proposes that Yamatai was located in the Kinki region, which proposes that it was located within this region, which includes present-day Nara, Kyoto, and Osaka. This theory gained prominence after the 1980s when archaeological excavations of the Hashahaka Kofun in Nara Prefecture revealed the burial mound to be from the early 3rd century AD, coinciding with the reign of Queen Himiko. This theory also takes into account the ancient text Izumo Fudoki, which mentions a land called Yamato, believed by some to be the original name of Yamatai. Despite the ongoing debate, the exact location remains a mystery due to a couple of different things. First is the lack of contemporary Japanese records from the Yayoi period, which makes it difficult to corroborate the Chinese accounts or provide additional context for the specific location. The earliest Japanese historical records, the Kojiki and the Nihon Shoki, were written several centuries later, and while they mention the Queen and Yamato, they do not provide a clear connection to the Yamatai Koku. The Chinese historical texts also provide very limited information about the geography of the Japanese archipelago, and the descriptions can be open to various interpretations, and obviously this would make it very challenging to pinpoint the location of Yamatai Koku based on strictly the text alone. And like I said, there have been archaeological discoveries of burial mounds, pottery, and other artifacts in both the Kyoshu and Kinki regions, but none of them can provide conclusive evidence linking them directly to Yamatai Koku or Queen Himiko. The archaeological evidence can support the presence of powerful and developed civilizations in both regions, but it doesn't necessarily confirm the location of Yamatai Koku. I probably butchered every single name in that, so if I did, correct me, please. But we're moving on. Number two, what happened to Queen Nefertiti? Nefertiti, whose name means the beautiful one has come, was an Egyptian queen and the great royal wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who ruled during the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. This was between 1353 and 1336 BC. Nefertiti is best known for her beauty and the famous bust that was discovered in 1912, which is now housed over in Berlin. Nefertiti was likely born around 1370 BC, though her exact origins remain unclear. She was possibly the niece or daughter of an official named Ai, who was a top advisor and then eventually became pharaoh when King Tut died in 1323 BC. Other historians, however, think that Nefertiti was actually a princess who hailed from the Mitanni kingdom in northern Syria. Under Akhenaten's rule, the traditional gods and goddesses were gradually phased out, and the Aden, which was just the sun disk, was elevated to the position of the supreme deity. Temples were built to honor the Aten, and the pharaoh himself was seen as the sole intermediary between the gods and the people. Akhenaten in Nefertiti's reign was also marked by significant artistic and cultural changes. 
This is known as the Armana period, and it was characterized by a new style of art that was more naturalistic and focused on capturing the everyday lives of people. This style was reflected in sculpture, painting, and even in the design of clothing and jewelry. Nefertiti then gave birth to six daughters, so Akhenaten then turned to marrying his own sister, who then gave birth to King Tut. King Tut would then eventually marry Nefertiti's third daughter, Roll Tide. Here's where it gets interesting, though. After 12 years of ruling over ancient Egypt with her husband, Nefertiti just completely disappears from any and all historical records. Some people think she simply just died, and others have some pretty fascinating theories. One theory holds that after Amun-Ra was reintroduced as the focal worship after Akhenaten's reign, Nefertiti was driven out of Egypt and sent into exile due to her ties to the worship of Aten. Another theory states that Akhenaten actually died himself, and that she either dressed up like a man to remain in power, or was actually the pharaoh Sminkar, who ruled sometime after Akhenaten. What's interesting, though, is that if Akhenaten did die, then it would have been Nefertiti who eventually reversed all the religious policies that were previously implemented. It is noted that during Akhenaten's reign, Nefertiti did order a scribe to make offerings, essentially pleading for the old gods to return due to all the upheaval caused by the religious conversion. Another theory states that she was banished because she was never able to have a son. You know, the six daughters marrying the cousins and daughters and all that good stuff I mentioned earlier or that she just committed suicide when one of her daughters died during childbirth. One final note about this, back in 2015, an Egyptologist found a hidden doorway within King Tut's tomb, which contained hints that there was a secret room on the other side that could possibly hold the tomb of Nefertiti. Following up on this, there was a study published in 2020 detailing a ground-penetrating radar survey conducted, which essentially gave credit to there being a hidden tomb, or even just a hidden room, inside the tomb. To this day, nobody has been inside this so-called anomaly, and the assumption that Nefertiti would even be in there is a long shot, especially with King Tut ridiculed throughout Egyptian history and all of his stuff being defaced and taken down by following pharaohs. But it could hold some answers, we don't really know, but moving on. Number 13, Venus figurine. A Venus figurine is just a term used to describe a type of prehistoric artifact that typically takes the form of a small stylized female figure. These figurines were created by early humans during the Upper Paleolithic period, which lasted from approximately 40,000 to 10,000 years ago. They are named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty, Venus, due to their association with fertility, sexuality, and feminine power. Venus figurines are generally small, ranging in size from a few centimeters to around 30 centimeters in height. They're typically made out of stone, bone, ivory, or clay, and were often decorated with carvings or engravings. Most of the figures depict women with exaggerated or emphasized features such as large breasts, hips, and thighs, and their faces are often minimized or not included at all. The mystery surrounding the Venus figurines arises from the fact that their precise purpose and meaning are not entirely clear. They were created by people who left no written records, and as such, their intentions can only be inferred through analysis of the artifacts themselves and the context in which they were found. One theory is that the Venus figurines were created as representations of a goddess or deified female figure, and this idea is essentially supported by the fact that many of the figurines have been found in ritual or ceremonial contexts, such as in burials or at sites of religious significance. Also, the exaggerated features of the figurines may be interpreted as a symbolic representation of feminine power and fertility, as a lot of these ancient societies had a mother goddess. Another theory suggests that the Venus figurines were created as fertility charms or magical objects, possibly used in rituals to ensure successful pregnancies and childbirth. Some have even suggested that the figurines may have been early forms of, um, pleasure? Anyways, there's also some figures that have been dated to even older, up to 400,000 years old, that are highly controversial. Obviously, this would push the date back of art and other iconography back further, but in general, I think it's unfair to say that one of the theories is more correct than others, since they do span thousands of years and thousands of miles from each other. Maybe one culture had a different reason than another to create one of these objects, but I don't think it's fair to just lump them all into one theory and make that theory mutually exclusive. Next. Number 14, the Inca Egypt Enigma. The Inca Egypt Enigma is a theory that proposes a connection between the ancient Inca civilization in South America and the ancient Egyptian civilization in North Africa. The theory suggests that there are similarities in culture, language, and architecture between these two civilizations that could have only been possible 
through transoceanic contact. People argue that the similarities in language are due to a common root language, while others suggest that there may have been an ancient seafaring civilization that facilitated the exchange of ideas and technology between the two regions. They point to similarities in the construction of the pyramids, the use of mummies, and the presence of megalithic structures as evidence of a shared cultural heritage. Just to go into a few of these similarities, the architecture, both civilizations built impressive pyramids, with the Inca pyramids being made of stone and the Egyptian pyramids being made of limestone. There are similarities in the way the pyramids were constructed, with both civilizations using a system of ramps and pulleys to move the massive blocks of stone, allegedly. Also, both civilizations practiced mummification with the Inca mummies wrapped in cloth and placed in a fetal position, while the Egyptian mummies were often placed in an elaborate sarcophagus. Both civilizations also had a sophisticated understanding of astronomy and used it to develop calendars and track the movements of the celestial bodies. And then there's the writing. Obviously, both had a form of writing, with the Inca using a system of knotted cords and the Egyptians using hieroglyphics, and they also both knew how to farm. And since they are so similar, they had to have had contact, right? The proponents of this theory suggest that there may have been an ancient seafaring civilization that facilitated the contact between the two regions, and this civilization then would have been lost to history. Then there's the trade routes theory, which suggests not an ancient advanced civilization, but essentially the similarities were the result of trade routes across the globe. They essentially proposed that the goods and ideas were exchanged along ancient trade routes, allowing for the transfer of technology and knowledge. Yeah, so um, some people think that the Sea Peoples could have also reached the Americas and influenced the Inca and pre-Inca peoples of Mesoamerica. Honestly, I don't know if the timetables match up on that, but um, yeah, I don't, I have no idea. Number 15, where was Homer's Ithaca? Homer's Ithaca refers to the island of Ithaca as described in the ancient Greek epic poem The Odyssey, which was written by the poet Homer, an AI or aliens or time travelers. Ithaca is the home of the poem's hero Odysseus, who is trying to return home to his wife, Penelope, and son, Telemachus. In the poem, Ithaca is depicted as a rocky island with steep cliffs and rugged terrain, and is also described as a fertile land with pastures and vineyards where the people engage in agriculture, animal husbandry, and trade. In terms of location, Ithaca is one of the Ionian Islands, which is a group of islands located off the western coast of Greece. It is a small island with approximately 96 square kilometers of area and a population of around 3,000 people. But is the current Ithaca the true Ithaca that Homer was referring to? This is a topic that has been discussed by scholars for centuries, and a lot of scholars have dismissed Homer's geography as mere speculation, while others have gone as far to say that ancient Ithaca includes Scotland and the Baltic. Although the present-day island of Ithaca seems to be the easiest answer, it does not fit Homer's description whatsoever. According to the epic poem, Ithaca was the farthest island in the west, while the other islands were facing the east. Modern Ithaca, which lies east of Kefalonia, does not meet this criteria. However, modern scholar Robert Biddlestone suggests that ancient Dilichion may have been modern Ithaca after refugees fled there following a natural disaster. Biddlestone's breakthrough came when he discovered a passage in Strabo's geography that described Kefalonia as having been once two islands. Strabo, who was an ancient author and geographer, wrote that the narrowest part of the island formed a low isthmus. This suggested that the channel that now separates Kefalonia from its peninsula had gradually filled in over time. This revelation led Biddlestone to theorize that Paliki, the western peninsula of Kefalonia, was once a separated island that eventually became connected to the rest of Kefalonia. If this were true, Paliki would have been the island farthest out to sea as described by Homer. Biddlestone acknowledges that just because the landscape is real, it doesn't necessarily mean that Odysseus was a real person. However, he does believe that it is plausible that the stories in the Odyssey grew around a Bronze Age chieftain. Biddlestone also argues that Homer did not invent an imaginary landscape, as real places like Troy, Mycenae, and Sparta have all been discovered by archaeologists. Most scholars agree that the Odyssey was first written down in the 8th or 7th century BC, but some, including Biddlestone, believe that the core narrative dates back to as far as the 12th century BC, just after the Trojan War. Biddlestone is convinced that Homer describes a real place in Ithaca, and that the locations he describes are recognizable to his audience. James Diggle, a scholar at Cambridge University, is cautiously supportive of Biddlestone's theory, 
noting that every place Fiddlestone locates in the book can be found in northern Paliki. If the channel exists and Ithaca is Paliki, then it's possible that the other passages in the Odyssey reflect the internal geography of Ithaca. Number 16, the Ninth Legion of Hispania. The Ninth Legion begins with its formation in the late 1st century BC. At that time, the Roman Republic was transitioning into the Roman Empire, and the legions were becoming more professional and centralized. The Ninth Legion was likely raised by Pompey the Great in Hispania, and it was originally composed of soldiers from that specific region. The Roman invasion of Britain was a significant military campaign that lasted for years, and the Ninth Legion played an important role in it. They fought in battles across southern Britain, including the decisive Battle of Medway, which secured the Roman foothold in the country. After the initial conquest, the Ninth Legion was stationed in various locations throughout Britain. They were based in York during the 2nd century AD, and it was during this time that they famously disappeared. The exact circumstances of their disappearances are unclear, and there are several theories that try to explain what happened. One theory is that the Ninth Legion was destroyed in battle. A Roman historian mentions that the legion was cut off during a campaign in Scotland, and it is possible that they were defeated by the local tribes. Another theory is that the Ninth Legion was disbanded or merged with another legion. This was common practice in the Roman army, and it is possible that the Ninth Legion was simply reorganized or renamed and called something different. A third theory is that the Ninth Legion was simply transferred to another part of the empire. This is supported by some archaeological evidence, including inscriptions that suggest that the Ninth Legion was stationed in other parts of Europe after their time in Britain. In recent years, there have been renewed interest in the fate of the Ninth Legion, and several new theories have emerged. Some scholars have suggested that the Ninth Legion was actually stationed in Germany rather than Britain, and that their disappearance was simply a result of poor record keeping. But yeah, essentially they just kind of disappeared, and we have no evidence to support any of these theories. Pretty wild. Number 17, the mystery of Jesus' missing years. Jesus' life between the ages of 12 and 30 are known as the missing years because there's little historical information about what happened during this period. Christian tradition suggests that Jesus lived in Galilee during this time, but modern scholarship acknowledges that there is little evidence to confirm this. Other theories suggest that Jesus may have worked as a carpenter, possibly in the town of Sepphoris, or studied with the Jewish sects such as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. Some believe that he may have even traveled to Britain to study with the Druids, and legends in Britain describe his presence there. Similarly, there are theories that he may have traveled to India and studied Buddhism and Hinduism, and that some of his teachings were influenced by these traditions. There are also theories that Jesus may have traveled to Japan during his lost years and learned about Eastern culture and Buddhism, and also survived the crucifixion and then buried beside Adam and Eve in Japan. I go way too in-depth about this topic in a previous video, specifically on the lost years of Jesus, so I'll put a card up top or a link down in the description or something. So go check out that video. It's pretty funny. Number 18, the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is a biblical story that has been studied and analyzed by scholars and theologians for centuries. It appears in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible and tells the story of the creation of the world and early human history. The story of the Tower of Babel essentially begins with the people of earth speaking one single language and living together in one place. They then decide to build a city with a tower that would reach to the heavens, which they thought would make them more powerful and great. However, God was not pleased with their plans as he saw their pride and arrogance. He decided to scatter them across the earth by confusing their language so that they could no longer understand each other. This caused confusion and chaos, and the people were unable to continue building the tower, so then construction just stopped. The name Babel is derived from the Hebrew word Balal, which means to confuse. The story is often interpreted as a cautionary tale about the dangers of pride and the importance of humility. It essentially teaches that humans should not become too ambitious or think too highly of themselves, as this can lead to their downfall. The story also highlights the diversity of language and culture, showing how God essentially created different nations and languages to reflect the richness and complexity of the world. But did the tower actually exist? In various ancient and religious texts, not just the Bible, it is mentioned that after a massive flood, humanity came together to build a gigantic tower known as the Tower of Babel, or a ziggurat to reach the heavens. The reasons for building the tower differ across the texts, but the decision to construct it was unanimous. It is believed that King Nabopolassar built the Etamanaki, which may have been the Tower of Babel, in 610 BC. 
According to some texts, King Nebuchadnezzar, who later ruled Babylon, claimed that the original construction of the Tower of Babel was much older. The tower was said to have a square base, stood about 300 feet tall, and was not completed. And then Alexander the Great came along and is believed to have demolished it during his conquest. There is also a legend in Central America that describes the tower as being built by seven giants who were saved from the Great Flood, and they constructed the tower to storm heaven, but then they were destroyed by fire. The original builder of the Tower of Babel, however, is said to have been King Nimrod. He was a tyrant who ordered his people to build the tower in an attempt to reach the heavens. According to Sir James George Fraser's book, Folklore in the Old Testament, 30 generations after Adam, people came together to build a tower. The purpose of the tower was not only to defy God, but also to challenge Abraham, who refused to participate in the construction. The Tharu tribe in Nepal and northern India also have similar legends about the tower. One account suggests that the tower was built to survive another great flood, while another text describes the tower's immense size, stating that it was over 8,000 feet tall and had a circumference of 80 miles. According to native folklore, the tower looked like a mountain with a hundred gates and living quarters, fields, and water fountains for the builders and constructors. Although this is controversial, apparently you can see the base of the tower from Google Earth right here. But just like the flood myths being across religions and cultures all around the world, the Tower of Babel being so specific and also being a part of various cultures around the world is baffling. Number 19. What happened to the 10 lost tribes of Israel? So the 12 tribes of Israel were the descendants of the 12 sons of Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. Each of Jacob's son became the founder of one of the 12 tribes, which were named after them. The tribe of Levi was unique in that they did not receive a territorial inheritance in the land of Israel, just like the other tribes did. They were given the responsibility of serving as priests and were supported by tithes and offerings from the other tribes. This was because Levi and his descendants were set apart by God to serve him in a special way. Then the tribe of Joseph was divided into two tribes because Joseph's two sons received a portion of the inheritance as if they were full-fledged tribes. This meant that there were 13 tribes in total, but the number 12 was still used to refer to the tribes as a whole. Each of the 12 tribes had its own distinct character, history, and territory in the land of Israel. For example, the tribe of Judah was known for its leadership and military prowess, and its territory included Jerusalem, which became the spiritual and political center of Israel. The tribe of Dan, on the other hand, was known for its seafaring and commerce, and its territory was located in the northern part of Israel. <clears throat> sea peoples. After the reign of King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two parts. The northern kingdom of Israel, which consisted of the ten tribes, and the southern kingdom of Judah, which consisted of the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The northern kingdom was eventually conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and the ten tribes that made up that kingdom were dispersed and became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom was later conquered by the Babylonians in 586 BC, and the remaining tribes were exiled to Babylon. Okay, now that the background's out of the way, let's get into some theories. In Jewish tradition, it is believed that the 12 tribes will be one day reunited in the land of Israel. This belief is based on the prophecy in Ezekiel 37, in which the prophet sees a vision of dry bones coming to life, and the nation of Israel being restored. The restoration of the 12 tribes is seen as a key aspect of the messianic age, when God's kingdom will be fully established on earth. Some other theories include the assimilation into other cultures. It essentially says that the ten tribes were assimilated into the cultures of the Assyrians and other neighboring peoples. This would mean that the tribes lost their distinct identity and became part of other nations, making it difficult to trace their descendants. Another theory is that the ten tribes migrated to other parts of the world, such as Africa, Europe, or Asia. This is based on the various historical accounts and legends that describe Jewish communities in these regions. For example, the Ethiopian Jews, also known as the Beta Israel, claim to be the descendants of the tribe of Dan. Then there's a theory that they essentially integrated with the Samaritans, who were a people that lived in the area of ancient Samaria, which was part of the northern kingdom of Israel. And according to some legends, the ten tribes were not lost at all, but rather hidden in plain sight. For example, the British Israelites movement claimed that the lost tribes had migrated to Britain, and that the British people were the descendants of the ten tribes. Classic. And then there's my personal favorite, the Shangri-La Theory. This is essentially a legend that holds that the ten lost tribes of Israel are living in a secret underground city in the mountains of Afghanistan, 
known as Shambhala or Shangri-La. The city is said to be a utopia where the ten tribes have been preserved in isolation from the rest of the world. The legend of Shangri-La can be traced back to the 1933 novel Lost Horizon by James Hilton, which describes a mystical valley in the Himalayas where people live for hundreds of years in peace and harmony, and the concept of the hidden utopia has since been associated with the legend of the ten lost tribes of Israel. According to the legend, the ten lost tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 BC and eventually migrated to the region of Afghanistan where they built the city of Shambhala. The city is said to be located in a remote and inaccessible part of the mountains surrounded by high walls and guarded by fierce warriors. The legend goes on to describe Shambhala as a city of great wealth and splendor with magnificent palaces and gardens and streets paved with gold. The people of Shambhala are said to be highly advanced with knowledge of science, medicine, and other fields that are far beyond what is known from the outside world. The legend also suggests that they are waiting for a time when they will emerge from their isolation and rejoin the rest of the world. And finally, the last piece of the first tier, one of my favorite mysteries of all, the mystery of the Great Sphinx of Giza. So there are a bunch of mysteries about the Sphinx. I'm just going to do a quick overview of a couple. One is who built the Sphinx and when. The exact age of the Sphinx is still debated, but most scholars believe it was built during the reign of Pharaoh Khafre in the Old Kingdom around 2500 BC. However, some theories suggest that it may be even older, dating back to the time of Pharaoh Khufu, who built the nearby Great Pyramid. Then there's the purpose of the Sphinx. The original purpose is unknown, but many theories suggest that it may have had religious or ceremonial significance, and some believe it was a symbol of the sun god Ra, while others suggest that it may have been used for astronomical observations, among various other things. Then there's what happened to the Sphinx's nose. It's one of the most well-known mysteries because the Sphinx doesn't have a nose, while some theories suggest it was intentionally destroyed by invaders, and others simply just think it fell off due to weathering and erosion. Then there is what lies beneath the Sphinx. Some theories suggest that there may be secret chambers or tunnels beneath the Sphinx, possibly leading to hidden treasures or ancient knowledge. However, no such chambers have ever been officially discovered yet. And then there is the significance of the Sphinx alignment. The Sphinx is aligned in a specific direction, facing due east towards the rising sun. Some theories suggest that the alignment may have had astronomical or religious significance, while others believe it may have been related to the Sphinx's original purpose. But in general, my favorite, obviously, is that the Sphinx was made by an ancient advanced civilization that predates any of the Old Kingdom dynasties. The water erosion theory is one of the more well-known aspects of this. It essentially proposes that the Sphinx, along with the surrounding structures at the Giza Plateau, was built by an earlier civilization that predates the pharaohs of the Old Kingdom. This theory suggests that the Sphinx was constructed during a much wetter period in Egypt's history, around 10,000 to 15,000 years ago, during the end of the last ice age. The theory is based on the idea that the deep grooves and fissures surrounding the Sphinx were not caused by wind erosion, as traditional theories suggest, but by rainwater, which is different than flood or normal water erosion. But essentially, proponents of this theory point to the fact that the grooves resemble those found in areas that have also been heavily eroded by rain. This then leads to the idea that the Sphinx was built by a civilization that was much more advanced than the ancient Egyptians, and this civilization specifically is sometimes referred to as the Lost Civilization, which is believed to have possessed knowledge and technology that was way ahead of its time. And then they take it as far to say that this ancient civilization may have been responsible for the construction of other ancient structures around the world, such as the megaliths at Stonehenge and the pyramids in South America. One of the main proponents of the water erosion theory is Robert Scock, a geologist and professor at Boston University. Scock argues that the deep grooves around the Sphinx are evidence of heavy rainfall in the area during a much earlier period than previously thought. He also suggests that the construction techniques used to create the Sphinx are more advanced than those of the Old Kingdom, indicating that it was built by an earlier civilization, which also ties into the theory that the original head of the Sphinx was not actually that of a pharaoh, but of a lion. This theory is based on a number of observations and analysis of the Sphinx, including its size, shape, and style. One of the main proponents of this theory is a French archaeologist and engineer who worked on the Sphinx restoration project in the early 20th century. He suggested that the head of the Sphinx was originally that of a lion and that it was later re-carved to resemble a pharaoh, possibly during the reign of Pharaoh Khafre in the Old Kingdom. This theory is based on a number of observations, including the size and shape of the head, as well as the style of the carving. 
He argued that the head of the Sphinx is disproportionately small compared to the body, and that it does not match the style of the other pharaonic portraits of the Old Kingdom. It's also suggested that the damage to the nose and beard of the Sphinx was likely caused by the recarving process. Other researchers have also supported this theory, pointing to similarities between the Sphinx and depictions of lions in other ancient cultures, such as the Assyrian and Babylonian civilizations. They argue that the original head of the Sphinx may have been replaced with a pharaonic head during a period of political or religious upheaval as a way of legitimizing power of the ruling pharaoh. Okay, but if it was originally a lion, why a lion? because the Sphinx was originally built with an astronomical purpose in mind. This theory suggests that the Sphinx was designed to align with the rising sun on the spring and fall equinoxes, and that its original purpose was to serve as a marker for the beginning and end of the Age of Leo. The Age of Leo is a period of astrological history that corresponds with the constellation Leo. According to this theory, the Sphinx was built during the Age of Leo, which occurred approximately 10,000 to 12,000 years ago, and is meant to serve as a symbol of the sun god Ra, who is associated with the lion. Proponents of this theory point to a number of observations and measurements of the Sphinx and its surroundings, including the angle of its face and the position of the sun at various times of the year. They argue that the Sphinx's face is angled in such a way that it aligns with the rising sun on the spring and fall equinoxes, and that this alignment would have been visible to ancient observers from a specific location. The theory also suggests that the Sphinx was built with a specific orientation that corresponded to the position of the constellation Leo during the Age of Leo. This would have required an advanced knowledge of astronomy and mathematics. Also, just to clarify, the most recent Age of Leo dates back to the end of the last Ice Age, but the significant rain erosion, possibly 20,000 years worth, and the climate change from rainforest in savanna to desert around six-ish thousand years ago in the Sahara North Africa region suggests that the Sphinx may be older than even that. It might be at least 30,000 years old. The closest age of Leo to that date would be around 34,000 BC. And this also assumes that it was built and no renovations or upkeep was done on the monument. So realistically, funny saying that in context, but the Sphinx was a lion that was built for the age of Leo, and it was left to fall apart and erode at least 25 to 30,000 years ago. Such a wild idea. It really gets into that just incredible theory about ancient advanced lost civilization and how much they actually learn technology and knowledge wise and all that it's a mind-blowing rabbit hole for sure it's definitely unhinged but i don't think people should completely ignore the thought either everything keeps getting older and older and we're always finding stuff that rewrites history well that about wraps up tier one thank you so much for watching i really appreciate it if i missed anything if i mispronounced anything or if you just want to add some crazy theories that you've heard definitely leave a comment. I love reading this. Thank you so much to my patrons, Bean, Fart, and Jag. It really does mean a lot having you along this ride with me. Oh, and come join the Discord server. Come hang. Come share your crazy theories. We'd love to have you. At the very least, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.